Hello everybody and welcome to this SUP Border interview with Mark Salter. Now Mark is an endurance SUP racer from the UK. He's competed internationally around the world. He's a Guinness World Record holder. He's also completed the non-stop and five-day edition for the 11 Cities SUP race. He's a UK endurance race champion in numerous events and also a record setter in the paddle skedaddle. We learn a lot about Mark in this interview and also his approach to endurance SUP racing. So sit back, relax, enjoy this interview, and we hope you learn a lot from Mark Salter. So I'm, a, I'm an inland water paddler from Nottingham. Uh, 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 our, our club is SUP Fitness UK, and that's my wife's club. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've been, been training there for eight years since, since I met my wife, actually. She was my instructor uh, when I started paddling. Our first few years, I'll just wrap it on, by the way, if that's, if that's okay. My first, um, my first few years was sort of social, social paddling in our club and, and, you know, getting to know everybody and going on adventures and things like that. Uh, and it was only sort of more in the last few years that we started to sort of get into the racing side of things. So middle of the country, canals, is, our main water is canals. So I think I've got a t-shirt on, uh, canal rats. There we are, canal rats. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, um, Pretty proud of we, we all should appreciate what we have, I guess, and and we don't have nice blue waters and seas and all that kind of lovely stuff that I'd love. But then at the same time, if you have that, you don't always get the type of water that we have, and we have water that you can paddle on kind of all year round. You know, we've got canals. Um, yeah, they're not quite as pretty as as some some places, but they are functional and they're there, and 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 we're so lucky to have them. We've got hundreds of hundreds of places to paddle here. Um, people always go, how do you paddle in Nottingham? But uh, yeah, we've got canals. Um, we've got the River Trent, which is brilliant. At the moment, of course, it isn't because it, it, whenever it rains, the Trent gets wild. It's, it's a fast-flowing river. Brilliant for training on the right conditions, but you have to be super careful on there, uh, of course. Uh, and then we've got lakes as well. So um, Cassie, my wife, teaches from two of the big lakes here in Nottingham, and they're, they're only two or three kilometres round. But, I mean, that's definitely enough for uh, you know, for lots of different types of water training. So, yeah, we're really lucky, actually. Yeah, definitely. It's something that you brought up there that I definitely miss about living like on the coast in down in Cornwall is that we don't have that flat water paddling. You know, you can't just kind of go out and train. It's very tidal here. If we go in the estuary, it has to be a high tide kind of thing to get the calm conditions. So to have that paddling all year round is is fantastic. And that must be, you know, your prime training ground, to be honest. Yeah, you can't. I mean, I do like to try and get to new places and we do lots of adventures. Um, I do love the sea. Um, but of course, I'm not a very good sea paddler because we don't live by it. I mean, our nearest sea is Skegness, and we don't really paddle there. It's too choppy on the North Sea, and that even that's two and a half hour drive or something, two hour drive. So it's um, yeah, we we don't get to do those sea technical races and stuff anymore. And it, and I think that almost splits. And whether it's the same in all countries, I don't know. But I would think in Britain that kind of splits the population a bit in terms of the paddling community. Um, it's not intentional. I mean, I, I loved it in the first sort of 2018, 19. I did all the GB SUP races, and I loved them. But you get to a point where you can't really compete with people that are out on the sea every day because most of those races are on on what I would call choppy water. Um, so we have to adapt to what we have. And you know, like I said, we have canals, but then worldwide, there's loads of great endurance racing going on. So you know, we get to go to those. So. Did you before getting into stand up paddling? Did you come from a sporting background? You seem like super fit you you seem like you're very active I, i'm guessing there was some kind of sports back then yeah i, I do but if, i'll be completely honest with you I, yeah i always burnt the candle at both ends so i had partied hard and i grew up uh, i was born in, in the 70s so um i grew up in the 80s and 90s when smoking was cool or deemed to be deemed to be whether it was or not probably not in hindsight but i was uh, you know i was a smoker and i smoked and also did sports so you know, back back in the day when you used to go and watch the rugby and have have uh, have a have a smoke in the bar afterwards with all the players, but that that's how our life was. Um, and so yeah, so I've never taken training seriously, um, but I have run. I ran for about thirty years. Um, used to go and do you know, running events. I was okay, you know, went went to some events and did okay. Um, and then kickboxing. So I kickboxed for fourteen years, and uh, now uh, I suffer. They were high impact sports, both running and yeah. kickboxing is high impact. So I'm yeah, you know, I'm 49 next month, but I've got a lot of arthritis. Whether that's new, whether that's um, just me or every 49 year old, I don't know. But but uh, my hip, my, my my lower back, and my shoulders, um, yeah, I've had quite a few scans, and I've got a lot of arthritis there. So that's something I have to manage. Yeah, exactly. Do you, does that affect you on a stand up paddleboard, or are you using different muscles? Do you find that it's a 
kind of a low I impact. It changed my life. Yeah, in fact, um, and it's a good question. When when I met my wife eight years ago and and got into paddleboarding, um, I was just about to go for an operation um, through the NHS um, to have my shoulders. Um, what they were going to do, it wouldn't have been nice, but to kind of get rid of the arthritis. So it would right. have been a pretty invasive shoulder surgery. Um, you know, I couldn't even be weights at the time or anything because of that. Um, and so when I met my wife, I thought, there's no way I'm going to really be able to get into this sport. And quite the opposite. If any, it, 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 I didn't have to have the operation. Um, lots of yoga, lots of stretching and lots of mm -hmm. paddleboarding which really helped. I think because you're moving constantly, there's no impact to the sport, really. Um, it's a low impact sport. You, everything in your body's moving, um, you know, from your feet to your shoulders the whole time. So that movement and that stretching and that everything, it just, it, yeah, it changed my life, really. So, yeah, no need for surgery. And, and no. paddleboarding has helped me massively. That's fantastic to hear. Oh, awesome. So good. Let's uh, let's start to jump into some of the incredible feats that you've accomplished on a, on a paddleboard. Um, those that watch you might already know that you have a Guinness World Record for the fastest fastest descent of Loch Ness uh, on a sub. So talk to us about that experience, how it came about, and just yeah, what made you want to do that? Yeah, I used to watch Record Breakers as a kid back in the eighties. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, we'd all, always thought that sounds nice to, uh, and uh, you know, I'd heard of other people, um, uh, you know, doing different challenges around the world and stuff. We've got a few American friends that had done some good challenges over there. Um, so I looked at the British routes, and there's only a couple of British routes that were approved by Guinness. And um, I guess Guinness can't go on and on approving things forever. So, so the routes that are there are pretty much long-standing routes that have been done in other sports. So, for example, um, Loch Ness was one. Um, I think there's one of the Channel, uh, one of the British Channel. Um, uh, there's, there's only a couple. Um, so um, I thought, well, let's have a go. Let's have a go at Loch Ness. Um, it's outside of my comfort zone for sure. Um, I had paddled on Loch Ness once with my wife uh, many years ago on a wide board. Um, and anybody who's ever been on Loch Ness um, knows that it's really unpredictable. Right. And it's, it's 36 kilometers long. And of course, um, it's surrounded by mountains. So the wind comes in at all different angles and directions. And as the lake, as you get, I guess it's the same for most of it, as you get halfway down that lake or that lot, um, the wind changes massively and picks up and things like that. So. Uh, and it's a long way. It's like an eleven-hour drive or something to get there. So what? <laughs> what I did is I I I got hold of a local. I thought there's no way I'm doing it without a safety boat. Like it just you know. So I kind of thought I'm going to invest into this. So I, I got hold of a local um, a local safety boat, a boat, a boat company there who did tours and things like that, and they they're, they're fantastic. Um, so they uh, they kind of ferried my wife and I to the start, and then followed in the boat because we had to have video footage with Guinness. You have to video everything. Loads right. of evidence, GPS, you name it. Um, so so they, they kind of helped throughout the whole journey and videoed the whole thing. Um, but what I didn't really have the luxury of was choosing the day. Um, so so it was kind of like, turn up, see what the weather's like. Because the weather changes within hours. It doesn't change even in days. It changes so quickly. Um, so we got there and I was sort of eating breakfast and we were, we were chilling out. And then the boatman rang me and he said, oh, maybe try now. And I was like, okay. That's when we sort of put the food down. And it was all very, like, it had to happen when it happened kind of thing and when we got out on the safety boat um and he ferried us to the start of the course um from from his base um it was way too big for me and i was like this is i, I said to my wife i said i can't do this i said it's, it's just choppy the wind was but we actually went it's a long narrow block obviously and we we went down one side of the lock in the boat to see what the waves were like and they were pushing straight into the bank so we went to the other side of the lock and the waves were pushing into the other side of the boat. Unbelievable that the waves, the, the kind of wind can split. Yeah. So I thought either side of the boat, I'm not going to go down the middle of the lot. Um, either side, I'm going to go down. There's going to be, I'm going to be pushed into the bank. So we kind of knew that it was going to be difficult. And, and it was, I, I mean, I can't guess how high it was. It was probably knee high or something. But for me, it was, it was messy as well. So you kind of get in the waves from different directions. So anyway, so we, um, we started off. And I think within about 400 meters, I started getting pushed into the bank. And I looked at my watch and my time was, and I was just like, forget it. Like, this, this is not going to happen. And my wife's on the boat shouting at me. She's going, you're here now. You've paid for the boat. Just get on with it. Even if it takes you all day, just just do it. You're here now. It's a good experience. And then, um, yeah, so I just kind of carried on. Fell off a few times. Got cold. It's cold. Uh, got cold and jumped back on and just puddled my heart out, really. I, I, I had done a fair amount of endurance training. So 
then yeah, just just kind of carried on and on and on, and then kind of the speed picked up. And then by the time the second half for the course came, I started to get a decent rhythm, and then wasn't falling off anymore. So kind of found the rhythm, I suppose. So then by, by the end of it, I was pleased to finish. It's one of those things that's sort of enjoyable in hindsight, um, more than more than at the time. But yeah, I, I was really high afterwards. I loved it. So yeah, yeah. fantastic. It's a, it's a decent time, I think. Four hours and one minute. So I've got. At the time, I was like, "Oh my god, one minute!" Like, if only I could have got three fifty nine. <laughs> but if you think about it, it's kind of a good thing because it means that I'll go back for sure, and then I'll try and knock try and knock that minute off, and hopefully not a bit more off. So, yeah, fantastic. Um, I mean, huge congratulations for that. It must have been an incredible experience as well. But just discuss a bit about your endurance training and maybe other events that you've done for you know training for endurance events. Um, especially part of the Loch Ness. Did you do any events beforehand? Yeah. I started racing in about 2018-19, as I said, with the shorter races. Um, and then difficult to train for those, I think, as we said. Uh, and then, so, yeah, I did uh, a couple of longer ones, sort of 21, I think it was, year 21. Did the Norfolk Broads Ultra um, and um, a couple of the Paddle Skedaddles and things like that, which are all sort of between sort of 27 to 75K, those kind right. of races. Um, there's not that many endurance races in Britain, actually. Um, so kind of go, go to what we could. Uh, and then Chatterjack. I love Chatterjack. It's my favourite event in the world. I, I st- it's still my favourite event. 51 kilometres down the Tennessee River. Um, wow. One day, hundreds of, uh, hundreds of people, like 600 people probably. Um, all different watercraft as well. And they play rock music and it's just like the coolest American vibe to it and play the national anthem and everything. It's, it's a cool race. Um, so I kind of did, I've, I've, I've done a couple of those kind of races. Um, nothing as big as eleven cities. Uh, um, yeah, so so sort of started to get the feel for slightly longer racing and and start to get into train. And then eleven cities, yeah. So that was uh, that was my nemesis race. That was it would be the way of saying it. So 2019, I actually went along with my wife and uh, her team. My wife, honestly, is the endurance paddler in our in our family. Um, she uh, I know she's out at the moment because of her back surgery, but she oh my god she 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 stuff she's done so she she uh it's done 11 cities twice um on inflatables uh, with her team so uh they did it on niscos on 20 12 six nisco boards uh one year uh and all went around together i think they were the first team to do it on a nisco and then last the year before last she did it on an inflatable uh and in the highest winds like they've had i think sort of 50 mile an hour winds plus uh and uh She's also done loads and loads of other stuff. So she uh, here at our local club, she's done um, two 24-hour non-stops around our lake um, before Last Paddler Standing sort of existed. And then a 36-hour one last year. And she was actually training for this year's Last Paddler Standing. Um, of course, she couldn't because of her surgery. But yeah, I think for, for next year or the year after, she'll be very much very much wow. back at it. So she's done loads of stuff. Um, uh, Coast to Coast England, 265 kilometers. Um, so my uh, my involvement in that was driving the van. Uh, I used to just turn up and drive the van and help people out and see them and watch them go and think that was crazy and not really get that involved in it. Um, it was always, I probably didn't want to put in the hard work that it needed. Right. And I didn't really have the bug for the longer races. And I kind of just wanted to go fast and do the shorter stuff. Um, and then when we were at 11 Cities in 2019, I, d- I did go along to it. Uh, and I had done a no training. So I thought, this is something, all right. I'll hammer it out. I got two days into the event. I think it was day three that my back just gave up on me. Uh, and and, uh, and you, you can't hammer it around the 11 cities course. Uh, not without training, of course. Not without the volume training needed. So that was a painful lesson. But as I said, I, was only, I had no expectations. I was only there as part of, part of the group, really. Um, so then my, the reason it was my nemesis race, because I went back in 2022. And um, by then I had trained. So I'd trained really hard. I'd trained probably a year and a half. I'd worked so hard on endurance. I'd done all the right stuff, um, all the volume training, all the off water training, everything else. And, uh, just wasn't my year. I, 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 um, ripped my abdominal muscle. Um, and I, um, it was the windy year that I was just talking about. So it was the, the 50 mile an hour wind week. Um, and there were three big lakes at 11 seas. And it's one of, it's a strange race. And um, if you've done it on a calm, day you probably won't remember the lakes too much but if you've done it when it's choppy those lakes are big um they seem big when it's choppy uh, and it was a choppy year and i had a 21 inch board uh, and and i fell in a few times hurt myself it's like it's not for me this year so yeah it was i learned 
more by my mistakes i think you know i, I I'm, I'm one of those people that sort of trial and error and make lots of mistakes and you know learn from yeah. that so i went back this year and finally finally had the best year ever and, and it was the most enjoyable week or two weeks probably we were there quite a while um the most enjoyable time i've ever had puddling absolutely lots of nice. um it's got some brilliant history if you've ever seen there's a movie actually about the ice skating it, it was a 220 kilometer ice skating event and now of course it's a sub event um and they love it they're so friendly and so like you say so inclusive with everybody um and now they actually do it they do the event you can do it as a one day or a two-day weekend if you right. want to just trial a day or trial the weekend days at the end um or the five day or of course the non-stop yeah the five day has um i don't know something like 200 people so it's a, it's a, it's a large amount of people on, on on the water um and and yeah it's really good caliber races as well i think I mean, lots of countries are into sub racing now, but the Europeans, and I think in particular, the, I would give it up to the Belgians, the, but they are very, very into it. Uh, there's a right. lot of very good paddlers over there. Uh, yeah, and of course, right. the locals, the, the Netherlands team as well. They're, yeah, it's uh, they're super, super good. So it's good to be competing with those um, those caliber of races. You sort of learn a lot from them. Also. Yeah, definitely. And and you mentioned briefly there that obviously it's a, you, know, you can do the five day event, 220 kilometers um, through the Netherlands. Um, in all the canals and the and the lakes, but you can also do it as the non-stop, so you can do it all in one. Yeah, the non-stop just had its tenth year, and yep. not as many people do that um, because it's, it's yeah, <laughs> it's pretty nuts. Um, yeah, and and so I did that this year as well. Um, so I think yeah, coming back after two disappointments, I was like, we're going to do them both. Uh, <laughs> so I did the non-stop. Only a handful of people have ever done both, um, and Andy, uh, my friend from our club here, uh, and I did the non-stop together. Um, and then we did the five day race kind of separate um, wow. and it worked really well. I think it was great. Um, uh, brilliant. Just, I mean, do the nonstop with a friend because actually there's so much, it's so, it's certainly mentally difficult as well as physically mm. and actually doing it with somebody um, I think was brilliant because you're paddling 10 hours in the dark. Yeah. We had thick fog. Um, you, you know, there was, there was so many challenges, the heat as well. So we had the hottest year this year. We were lucky. We didn't have the cold and the wind so much. Um, but we had the heat and it was mm. incredibly hot. Um, uh, we had all the boats out because it was like the hottest weekend. So there were hundreds of boats on the water. There were right. so many challenges. But the, the yeah. fog at, at night was pea, was what we call pea soup. So, you know, I mean, you couldn't see the bank. And honestly, you couldn't see the bank. We were just shouting to each other. We had lights on, but there were no use in the fog, really. Um, and and probably for ten, the best part of 10 hours, we were just shouting to each other as to where we were, like turn left here or turn right there. and. Luckily, Andy's really good at navigating and didn't get lost. Otherwise, I would have been lost. It was good. So probably more like, on average, 10 people a year do the nonstop, something like that. It might be a few more this year, actually, maybe 15. But normally, it's around 10 people. And it's probably got something like a 30%. I think I've done the right thing here. Something like a 30% dropout. Very tough. But you did both, That's which is a huge achievement. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't really decided. So, so the story is that my wife was going to do the nonstop. Um, and I was going to support her, and then I was going to do the five day. But because, you know, sort of a month or two before that, she found out she needed the surgery. Um, so she said, "Why don't you give it a go?" And I was like, "Okay." I'd, I'd actually tried um, a couple of nine, ten hour paddles. That was the longest I'd ever done. Nine, it us. And I, every time I did a nine hour paddle or ten hour paddle, I got sick um, from uh, the food and the hydration. You mm -hmm. know, so the hydration stuff we use is brilliant. Hammer nutrition, they, we use heed, we use perpetuum. That that's what everyone uses really. Mm -hmm. People use Tailwind as well. They're, they're the good brands, really. Um, so nothing wrong with the solution. But when you're constantly having that solution for as was our 36 hour nonstop, right. you get you know, I got sick. Um, and every time I tried to train, I kept getting ill. Um you just I just wanted to you can't bring it down enough. You just want to vomit, but you have to have so many calories an hour. So then you're trying to eat at the same time. So you eat, you know, and then what do you eat? Is it is it high sugar? Is it low sugar? So there's lots of experimenting going on. But basically, I didn't get my food right until the event, really. Um, okay. um, I, I tried. Um, so, and it was really because my wife and I had some serious discussions this summer. She was like, I can't do it, Mark, because I'm ill. Uh, injured, sorry. Uh, and and um, you give it a go. And I was like, look, I, I know I, I can't. But she's she's a great coach. And she she gave me the confidence that I could give it a go. So um, I went out. We went out there, and she she met her and and Rona, our friend, and um, met us probably nine times along the route. So every one okay. there's, there's there's three agreed kind of stops that you know for the five day. And those five 
it's the same course for the non-stop. So, mm-hmm. so they met us with water and drinks and ice cubes, ice creams as well, because it was that hot. Um, and uh, I got nine hours into the event and predictably felt sick. And I, I mean, I was, I was in that much pain, like not wanting to, you know, whatever the word is, wanting to vomit. Yeah. So I was in that much discomfort, is the word, I think. Uh, and I was saying to her, like, please let me stop at this next stop. And she was like, no, no, give it one more stop and we'll see you in another 30 kilometers, roughly. 25 kilometers. And I was like, look, it's one more stop, Mark. And then I get to the next stop and I'm like, I want to stop. I want to stop. And she's like, no, no, one more stop, one more stop. And then I'll, okay, I'll meet you in 30 kilometers and then the next one. And then we got throughout the night, which was said was tricky with a the fog. Then um, I'll meet you at the next stop, Mark. Like, okay. And then she met us. She met us at the breakfast stop and they unbelievably, in the middle of the Netherlands, met us with a McDonald's breakfast. Awesome. And it was the best thing the fat the salt the the caffeine everything everything i wanted and honestly from then on so we were probably only 20 hours in at the event then or something and from then on it felt great you know so wow. it just needed that reset i think the sun came up apparently that is a thing the sun comes up and psychologically you just feel it's a, it's a new day but you, you do have a reset yeah. so um yeah so she 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 kind of basically convinced me to do the non-stop i'm so pleased she did i never would have done it without her i wouldn't have even attempted it that alone got round it um and then so there we go so andy and i finished the non-stop together and it was sort of very emotional they, they all jumped in the water to meet us at the end with the medals and everything oh nice the most enjoyable thing ever the hardest thing i've ever done by far and andy said the same by far the hardest thing what would you when would you ever have 36 hours of discomfort um and it, it really was discomfort uh but the most rewarding the most rewarding experience and it is tawny but it's it just feel like it changes you in some ways, you know, to sort of know that you can sort of anything I do in the future, you know how much you can suffer and kind of and move on. And you, yeah, we had uh, so so finished finished the day. Uh, first, I had to be sort of helped off the board and then carried to the car. My legs had gone completely. My my knee, had, I never had knee problems that I knew of, um, but I had um, uh, again, I never experienced inflammation below the waist before. So my legs and feet. And my hands actually were like sausages. It's just, just like, um, and and I've never never had that. Uh, and and although that kind of looked weird and was strange and funny, um, it, it inflamed my left knee. Um, um, so I think what happens is that any sort of bit of weakness in your body, even if you don't know you've got it, will inflame. So my knee, uh, around twenty hours of that event, started to grind and click and creak, um, and I couldn't put any weight on it. Um, so I had to paddle and all my photographs from, from that distance on, I'm paddling on the right hand side, or almost all of it, certainly couldn't put any weight on the left. So my board's tilted to the right. And that meant that all my weight was on my right foot and my white, my, my feet had, had blown up as well. Um, and then my heel got so blistered, never had blistered heels before, um, that I couldn't, couldn't put any weight on the heel. So, so I was paddling on the right ball of the right foot with a bent leg. And, and uh, by the by the end of the race, um, I had my first and only fall I've ever had off that board. Actually, um, I was like a few hundred meters from the finish line, and, and my legs had gone like a bo- you know like a boxer who's on the last round. It's they were just shaking uncontrollably. My legs. So, yeah, it was um, it, it was it was tough. There's no two ways about it. But it was it was brilliant and one of the most enjoyable things I've ever done. So yeah, that's, that's amazing. So how did, how did you go from that to the five yeah, day it, like how 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 long was the yeah. break in between and how did you recover two days. just two days that's it yeah yeah they don't have long because i suppose people are out there for the organizing the event so you can't give you too long um yeah not many people have done both and that was that was a bit of a driver so i said well this be good so get, let's give the five day a go and, and um to, to see if we can just just again just maybe see if we can do a day and and see how the first day of the five day goes we're here anyway um so yeah um i think the next that night was in a bad way so it's hallucinating i was seeing spiders running up and down the place and it's kind of horrible um and then the next day I woke up went for a huge breakfast sat and ate we basically ate all day we, we had breakfast into lunch straight into dinner i think so we just ate a lot and then walked around the town a bit to get the blood flowing um and then the next day was registration for the five day and straight on it so um it was it was a last minute decision and it really was we actually booked the change the ferry home um, and booked an extra hotel to stay. So we wasn't sure if we we're going to stay or not. And um, uh, like at midnight, we changed the ferry. Um, uh, we're supposed to be on it the next morning. So stayed just stayed in the five day. And um, yeah, the day one was 
I, I went and spoke to the organizer after day one and I said that was the most enjoyable day's paddling I've ever had. It was so much fun because it, it felt like a giant lap of honor because we'd just done the nonstop. And then to do the five day. So the first five the first day of the five day is about 50k. It's the longest day. It's probably 51k or something like that. Um and uh just paddling along, just waving to everybody, and oh, this is brilliant, and you know, like being cheered on because everyone knows you did the non-stop, and it's just it was so much fun. Um, and I came in the end of day one thinking I was probably around ninth, eighth or ninth um place, not really, you know, understanding. I was I was, it was in fourth. Um so I guess it was just a high of of, of it so sort of carrying me around, really, and and um and the body just recovered so quickly, even at even at my my age of like i said 49 coming up um it, it just reco- that 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 was the one thing of the whole thing that surprised me was that the body recovered so quickly and then the next by day two and day three and actually what was even more by day four and five of the five day i was getting faster every day so i'd heard heard this you know people that do like 50 That's marathons crazy. 50 days yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that and and you hear it and I'd, I'd heard it before and i thought no it can't be true they reckon if you do this like i think it's like the it was definitely a five, 50 marathon thing that I heard. I reckon after about five days of five marathons, your body just adapts to it and it just becomes right. easier. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like, just, Fair I, enough. I didn't, yeah. believe, I didn't think that would happen to, to me, but it, it does. Yeah. 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 Uh, so day two was really cranky and, but I thought oh, I'm going to try and race this. And that was hard work. And then day three, four and five, it just became easy and um, easier. And, yeah. and, and then I started to race and, um, it was a really close position between three of us for third place. Um, so it could have been third or fifth quite easily, really. Um, and then luckily had a really good last day and managed to get the third in the men's open. So, yeah, yeah. There are other categories as well, but the men's open was the one I wanted to go in. So, yeah, yeah, it was good. Amazing. Was good. Well, big congratulations. That's a huge effort. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it was um, good fun. Uh, it's given me the bug now to go and do more stuff, I think. I want to know mentally what it's like. I don't know if we've spoken about the mental challenge yet. You've said it's definitely a mental game, but I want to know how you prepare for something like that and what goes through your mind when you're doing it. Obviously, it's like elation. It's amazing once you've completed it, but how do you get through those challenges, especially, you know, with your body starting to, you know, feel the the pain and things like that? How do you continue on through that? Obviously, your wife is a huge support in that, but but mentally, how, how, do, you, how do you prepare? Yeah, that is a really good question and quite a tough one, I suppose. Yeah, I think, I guess you have to, I think for me, I have to really in, like look forward to the event and want to enjoy the event. I don't think I could just, couldn't just go to any event. You know, it has to be the right one. I think that's the thing. So, so um, and, and I need that in the diary. So I, I don't, let's say there were no events next year, God forbid. Um, I'm not sure if I would still be disciplined enough to have that motivation to just keep going out there. I need something in the diary and it needs to be enjoyable. So like I said, Chatterjack, 11 cities, those kind of like amazing. And there's some great events in this country too. Um, you know, it's where there's, there's a great vibe and you know that you're going to enjoy it. And I think, I think for me, and I, I need that focus. Everyone's different, but you know, I need that. And then, um, yeah, you know, I gotta try and make things as easy for myself in training as I can. So I have headphones, I listen to audio books and just do that base level work. And and that just gives the confidence, I think, when the event comes along. Um as I said, sort of coming from a, a background of, of, of probably higher impact sports or faster sports, we took some discipline to try and knock that down. But for endurance, um, and I'm going more physical here rather than mental, I suppose. Um for endurance it really is about training level one and two um so you know there's a bit of wind training and a bit of interval training in the wind is very useful and a bit of choppy water training but, but mostly 90 percent of the work i would say is is level one training or level two training so it's about getting speed and glide um but at a low heart rate so because you're losing less calories then so the lower the calories the lower the burn and the, the easier on the body so yeah i think that that takes discipline i think to 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 change the mindset I still want to be a fast paddler, but actually most of my work needs to be at a low level. Um, and it's really interesting. There's loads of really top paddlers who who have have done that in recent times. So April Zilk's a, a good one who talks about that a lot, um, who who has um, gone back to work in their base. And I'm sure Seisha will be the same and loads of other great paddlers. And Larry talks about it, going, going back to work in your level one. 
back to that base and building that and how much that then improves your faster paddling as well not just the lower level paddling so yeah that seems to work i know you're probably definitely going to be doing the 11 cities again at some point in the future and a lot of other endurance race but is there anything you do differently from your last experience at 11 cities not fundamentally different but probably more off so i think more choppy water training definitely those lakes are always going to be there so you know and they zap the energy um, I think that's the thing. So even on a even on a day that's fairly moderate, they can easily be knee high, and that that really does zap the energy and zap the body. So I need more of that. I definitely need to train the food more and be more scientific with that. And as some of the really top world paddlers, the world champions and whatever, you know, they really know their calories inside out and exactly how they're going to take them on board. So that's something that we'll always be learning. I doubt you can ever learn nutrition enough. It's just it's just this ongoing training. So I think more of those kind of things really. I got the twenty twenty two inch. 404 jump and for my size and my weight it's absolutely perfect um yeah, it's the right buoyancy the right size and uh, i've only fallen off it once so yeah it's... yeah nice well let's just move on from with, with that equipment what else do you use and what are the kind of things that you always paddle with like what paddles are you using and also what pieces of equipment do you always take with you At the moment i'm with starboard lima this is my paddle um and the hippo stick have got some really good ones coming out so i'm gonna have a look at that first when it comes out um so yeah um at the moment that's that's the one for me um yeah i love my 404 uh and then yeah other equipment so uh i suppose with um safety wise I always carry a dry bag and a phone um it's really important uh and my phone also has my audio book so yeah like i said i, I get i don't want to be in my own head too much i like i like audio but listen loads of comedies so, yeah um, nice. <laughs> I mean, yeah well I used, to, I used to be in a, like reading horror books and horror movies and stuff like that but it's not very good when you're paddling all night on your own so uh yeah comedies, that's true. Comedies are better. <laughs> no, yeah not great so uh, something light-hearted and easy to listen to that, and that you can dip in and out of as well i think because again if you try and listen to a novel when you're when you're paddling you can you'll miss a bit and then you'll be like oh no i can't rewind it now so yeah uh, lots of comedies and autobiographies and stuff like that so yeah i'd say my aftershock my uh, shocks headphones are my like number one number one thing um so yeah so that that's 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 pretty much it uh, like Kobe life vest i got like, one of those slimline ones that's really luxury so yeah and then of course at the moment um boots yeah everybody wants to know about boots and that stuff um so we wear mitts in the winter even though you think you wouldn't be able to grip the paddle we, we wear the mitts haven't been to glaglar a couple of times you, you can paddle in them and it's it's fine um but with the boots but boots is hard to get right isn't it we, we um a lot of the time use neoprene boots and stuff but they're not that warm the um for me i just found this year you know the vibro barefoot boots yes. um or should they make trainers don't they for the gym and stuff yeah. um, they do a waterproof walking boot and yeah. it's so nice because it's you can well, splash water on it all day and it doesn't get wet and it's warm amazing so. and because they're low sole i don't like a big sole when i'm paddling no. so they're, they're a flat sole so it's the best of all worlds perfect so, okay they're, they're my favorite footwear uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to this conversation at all anything you feel like we've missed no, I mean, I, I really should say thank you, so that's all right. Yeah, I think to uh, mainly to my wife, who's encouraged me to paddle in the first place and you know supports me throughout. Um, yeah, I definitely wouldn't be doing it without her in, in every way. Um, and just looking forward to her getting better so I can support her next year. Um, and then, yeah, all our team who come along to support us and watch us online and all that kind of stuff as well. And, and with the Loch, uh, Loch Ness Challenge, um, Craig Sawyer did my evidence for me. He did all the... the gps hard work and the video editing and all that stuff that guinness needed um you know we've got some great members of the team who look after our equipment and fix up fix my boards and my paddles so yeah such um such good to have support from everybody you can't do it on your own no that's so true and i just yeah really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us it's been really inspirational and and really learned a lot speaking to you about endurance paddling and hopefully everyone got a lot out of it but um What's next for you, Mark? What What's on the plan for 2024 and into the future? Yeah, there's loads. Um, so uh, the first event should be in April, um, and that's good. My wife's running it for the first time this year. So uh, here in Nottingham, we've got the River Trent, uh, and there's she's going to do a 40-kilometer downriver race. So it will be the longest, I think I'm saying this right, the longest downriver race in, in Britain. Um, it's going to be brilliant fun, hammering down the Trent. Um, so we go from from Nottingham to Newark, um it's a, it's a, we've done that route several times as a club but to do it as a race and an open race for everybody should be brilliant so we're just waiting on she's waiting on the commissions at the moment and doing all the paperwork for that so that should be running in april so it's called race to the castle uh and then that starts the season off really so then we've got got the paddle skedaddle in may which is a really favorite event of mine 27 kilometers in norfolk 
um, which I like. So it's sort of a, it's sort, I would yeah, sort of say it's a, it's a bit of a sprint, really. <laughs> 27K, it's a sort of a fast, it's a threshold race, I would call it. Okay. So it's great fun. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we've got loads of challenges as a team. Um, June, I'm really interested in an event in Belgium. As I said, uh, 11 cities, Belgium, have a lot of the top paddlers mm. um, uh, uh, over there. So that'll be really good to mix it up with those guys uh, and, and, and ladies over there. Um, nice. 11 cities, of course. Chat Jack if we can get over to America next year. It's my favorite. Um, yeah, so l- lots more I probably can't even remember, but trying for the longer ones um, from when they come. Every, you know, every year, they don't all go ahead, but you know, hopefully enough of them go ahead to to keep keep me motivated. I always think you need probably three or four a year to really, really keep me keep me going. So, yeah, definitely it should, oh. should be a good year. Right? Yeah, amazing. We're well, wishing you all the best in those events, and obviously Thanks with training much. and everything. And and yeah, just thank you again for chatting with us. Well, thanks so much for the call. It's been nice to have the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Mm-hmm.